Few of us, I suppose, can hear plain song without experiencing a kind of nostalgia. In part, no doubt, this has to do with an awareness of lost innocence, an irrecoverable musical innocence, that is. But essentially, like all forms of period nostalgia, it's a sense of something desirable because so different from the world as we know it. A tranquility, a spirituality, a timelessness. And if we think of the cathedral at Worcester, of the quiet, reassuring authority with which it stands above the River Severn, on a gentle bend in the river, it's beautifully situated. How easy, then, to let our imaginations subvert our historical selves. Even now, or perhaps more now than, say, 50 years ago, the medieval period has a strong romantic appeal, and our great cathedrals are inescapably a part of that. History can provide an equally strong corrective. At Worcester in the Plainsong centuries, the tranquility I mentioned, if that's how it seemed at the time, was on a number of occasions violently shattered by fire and sword. For example, during the struggle for power between Stephen and Matilda, Worcester was twice sacked and burnt. Many of the townsfolk sought refuge in the cathedral, and we're told that the chanting of the office blended with the wailing of women and the cries of children. What of the spirituality? According to tradition, this was very real in the time of Bishop Oswald in the 10th century and in that of Bishop Wollstone, who built the Norman Cathedral. But sooner rather than later, men resembling Chaucer's monk, a lord full fat and in good point, must have been prominent at Worcester, for the cathedral was the church of a really big Benedictine monastery. At the time of the Doomsday Survey in 1086, no fewer than 50,000 acres of land were held by the bishop or the monastery, and there was more to come. Agriculturally speaking, this was big business. And in the later 13th century, surely it was prosperity rather than spirituality that enabled the monastery at Worcester to become an advanced musical center. This is tantalizing. Enough music has survived, quite haphazardly, for it to be clear that there must have been a great deal more. The Worcester fragments, as they're called, were recovered from the bindings of books. Many are fragments indeed, which is doubly tantalizing. Others have proved sufficiently complete for scholars to reconstruct them. There's much evidence of pioneering, the use of sonorous thirds and six-three chords, sometimes with the melody in the top part. Writing in four parts at a time when this was little favored on the continent, the development of free composition, without even a nominal plain song basis, that is. Perhaps the best known of these Worcester manuscripts is Alleluia Salat, a three-part composition in a lively dancing rhythm. The only plain song element is at the end in the lowest part, and surely there's a background of popular song and dance.
As it stands today, Worcester Cathedral is mainly a 14th century building. All that remains of Wollstone's Cathedral, to the eye at least, is the celebrated Norman crypt and some part of the transepts. The choir and lady chapel are early English, a particularly beautiful example of the style, and the nave and tower are 14th century decorated. The result is a harmonious wholeness, seldom found where there's been such extensive rebuilding. For those involved were not given to period nostalgia. They always built anew in the fullest sense, regardless of stylistic clashes. Gloucester is a prime example, as we'll see. Now, the 14th century, despite much conflict, heavy exactions by both king and pope, and the Black Death, was throughout England one of the great ages of monastic building. Much increased revenues from the monastic lands, especially from the wool trade, this is the general explanation. At Worcester there was another factor, the immense popularity of the shrines of St Oswald and St Wollstone, which rivaled that of St Thomas at Canterbury and was a major source of income. So much so, that when Gloucester promoted the murdered Edward II as a holy martyr and for a time creamed off the pilgrim trade, building at Worcester was suspended for 40 years. Pilgrimages to the shrines of saints were, of course, a universal remedy. It's said that King John, in asking to be buried in the choir at Worcester, which he duly was, believed that with Oswald on one side and Wollstone on the other, even he might stand the chance on the Day of Judgment. You know, that's more likely to be true than a number of things that used to be taught about King John, and perhaps still are. The Reformation swept away the monastery, the shrines, and much else besides. At Worcester, a lot of the destruction of the kind usually attributed to the Cromwellian age, the beheading of sculptured figures, the smashing of stained glass, was in fact carried out by the commissioners of Edward VI. As early as 1551, on what is now College Green adjoining the cathedral, the medieval service books were burnt. Only one is known to have escaped, the priceless Worcester Antiphona, from which the chant at the beginning of this programme was taken. In the Elizabethan and Jacobean period, Worcester had rather more than its share of able musicians. One of them, the long-lived Thomas Tompkins, he was organist for fully 50 years and nominally for another 10, is a major figure, the most considerable creative musician in the cathedral's history. First, though, Nathaniel Giles, who was organist and master of the choristers in the early 1580s. He came from a musical family, his father was organist at St Paul's Cathedral. And when he left Worcester, it was to take up an appointment at St George's Chapel, Windsor. Here now is Giles's verse anthem, Out of the Deep, a setting of Psalm 130.
Another of these Elizabethans is Nathaniel Patrick, who was at Worcester from 1590 until his early death five years later. Not much is known about him, but he left secular as well as church compositions, and a little of his service music has circulated widely in modern editions. This Magnificat, for example, from a service in G minor. And now Tompkins. In effect, he succeeded Patrick and married his widow. But there was a short interregnum with the strange and difficult John Fido, previously organist at Hereford, temporarily in charge. Fido seems to have stepped in again whenever Tompkins was away in London, where he kept up his interests and connections. Before coming to Worcester, Tompkins had studied in London with none other than William Byrd and he was later appointed, part-time that is, to the Chapel Royal. Arguably, Tompkins was too big for Worcester. After the death of Orlando Gibbons in 1625, he was the foremost all-rounder in English music. We'll hear two examples of his work. First, the anthem, O Sing Unto the Lord a New Song, written at some time before 1617. This is a setting in seven parts, rich in texture, of words from Psalm 149.
The Tompkins era was abruptly ended when Cromwellian forces took control of Worcester in 1646. The cathedral organs were dismantled, there was further destruction of stained glass, and the cathedral ceased to function. Tompkins, we're told, found consolation in writing keyboard music, and it's certainly true that most of his Virginal's pieces date from this last period of his life. But so does the organ voluntary we're going to hear next. This was written just a year after the shutdown, at a time when there can have been little prospect of a resumption of services, yet it's richly inventive in the old tradition, and again shows Tompkins as a successor to Bird. the Restoration, the traditional services were, of course, resumed, and the money was raised for a new organ, built in 1666 by the famous Thomas Harris. But some strange things smacking of radical Protestantism were still to happen at Worcester. 
In 1712, for instance, there was an orgy of whitewashing, particularly in the choir and the lady chapel. Even the finely wrought columns of Purbeck marble were whitewashed. Also in the 18th century, the laying down of a new stone floor was made the opportunity for clearing the nave of its tombs. Some were destroyed, others placed out of the way. Not that the nave was used much, for the services were held in the choir, so small were the congregations. Indeed, throughout a large part of the 18th century, and perhaps well into the 19th, the only activity that regularly brought the nave into use was the Three Choirs Festival, held at Worcester every third year. Now, it's well known that the Three Choirs has a continuous history from around 1715, and may have had its origin in the festive Te Deum performed at Worcester in 1713 to celebrate the Treaty of Utrecht. What isn't so well known is that in the middle of the 19th century, in the third quarter to be precise, there was a strong puritanical movement to stop the festival once and for all. The Earl of Dudley tried to buy off the Worcester Festival by putting up £10,000 for the much-needed restoration of the cathedral. And it was at Worcester that the showdown came in 1875, the year of the Mock Festival. There must be no orchestra or soloists, said the Dean and Chapter. No platform, no tickets, no secular concerts, and even no oratorio. So extreme was their attitude that it brought about a healthy reaction, and in the following year at Hereford, the entire chapter enrolled as festival stewards. However, it was in this same period, from the mid-1850s onwards, that Worcester Cathedral was put in the decent order that we know today. Over 20 years, there was a massive restoration of the fabric, both inside and out. The ubiquitous whitewash was removed, new east and west windows were put in, the solid choir screen was taken out and the organ moved, opening up an unbroken vista, and so on. The precincts too were set in order. In fairness, it must be said that the same Earl of Dudley paid for much of this. It seems that the new spirit of caring for the cathedral and a decided narrowness concerning its use went together, given the background perhaps inevitably. In the hundred years or so since the restoration was completed, both the historical sense that came in then, something more than nostalgia, and the use of the cathedral for music making have developed enormously. The musical emphasis is, I think, a reflection of three things. A succession of outstanding organists and choir masters, a changing climate of opinion, especially since the Second World War, and local need. This last is clear-cut. Nowadays, when there's a symphony concert in Worcester, it's at the cathedral. There's really nowhere else, nowhere large enough. And the Festival Choral Society is the town's foremost promoter of music. It was towards the end of the Victorian era that a new musical vitality began to develop. I think of Hugh Blair, who was organist for only two years in his own right, before leaving under an alcoholic cloud. Blair was a young man with new ideas. He gave the first three choirs performances of both Bach's B minor Mass and Verdi's Requiem. Here to represent him is the Nunc Dimittis from his evening service in B minor.
Blair was one of the first musicians to give Elgar practical encouragement by performing his music. As a Catholic, Elgar had no formal links with the cathedral, but in his early years he played the violin in the orchestras got together for the festivals. Elgar and Blair became good friends and remained so long after their Worcester days. Blair took up the cantata, The Black Knight, and arranged for the invitation to write The Light of Life for the Worcester Festival of 1896. But he's most associated with the organ sonata, of which he gave the first performance in the cathedral. One wonders what exactly he played it on, for at that time, 1895, the bizarre Robert Hope Jones was in the throes of rebuilding and combining the two cathedral organs. This instrument broke down completely in 1921, since when it has twice been rebuilt by Harrison and Harrison. As an example of its present capability, here's the first movement of Elgar's sonata played by Donald Hunt.
Psalm 121, sung from the Worcester Psalter. Atkins's successors, all four of them, can have only the briefest mention here. First, in the 1950s, David Wilcox, an outstanding choral and orchestral conductor as well as choir master. Once again, standards were raised, and the Festival Choral Society particularly was revivified. Wilcox, of course, went on to King's College Chapel, Cambridge, and thence to the RCM as its director. But it was at Worcester that he first made his reputation, nationally, that is. And so, as a memento of those years, we've chosen a typical carol arrangement of his. Tomorrow shall be my dancing day. Wilcox's immediate successor was Douglas Guest, but he wasn't at Worcester long before moving to Westminster Abbey. Then came Christopher Robinson, another outstanding conductor and choir trainer, as any Worcester organist needs to be nowadays. Like Nathaniel Giles in the 16th century, Robinson left Worcester for Windsor and St George's Chapel. That was in 1975, which brings us up to date with the arrival of Donald Hunt, who came to Worcester from Leeds Parish Church, where he enjoyed a lively and distinguished reputation. From his own compositions, he has chosen the Sanctus from a Missa Brevis for choir and organ. With Donald Hunt, 
Worcester is continuing its recent tradition of strong conducting. Need I say more than that he's prepared to tackle Mahler's Eighth Symphony? How many cathedral organists would be, I wonder? He has a special interest in latter-day French church music, and to conclude this program, apart from the recessional, that is, he's chosen the Gloria from the Mass for two choirs and two organs by Vidor.
Worcester Cathedral, Reflections in Words and Music, was presented by the late Hugh Otterway. The opening and closing plain chant was taken from the Worcester Antiphona, and the music heard in programme order was Alleluia Psalat from the Worcester Fragments, Out of the Deep by Nathaniel Giles, and a setting of the Magnificat by Nathaniel Patrick. Then we heard two works by Thomas Tompkins, The Anthem, O Sing Unto the Lord, and an organ voluntary played by Dr Donald Hunt on the cathedral's chamber organ. This was followed by a setting of the Nunc Dimittis by Hugh Blair, and the first movement of Elgar's organ sonata, played by Dr Hunt on the cathedral's great organ. Then came a setting of Psalm 121 from the Worcester Psalter, edited by Ivor Atkins, David Wilcox's carol arrangement of Tomorrow Will Be My Dancing Day, The Sanctus from Dr Donald Hunt's Missa Brevis, and finally the programme ended, apart from the closing plain chant that is, with the Gloria from Vidor's Mass for Two Choirs and Two Organs. The choirs taking part were the Worcester Cathedral Choir and the Scholars of the King's School, and the organ accompaniments were played by Paul Trepte, assistant organist at Worcester Cathedral, and Andrew Millington, assistant organist at Gloucester. The music, recorded in June 1977, was directed by Dr Donald Hunt, and the programme was produced by Gillian White in Birmingham. <laughs>